There are many misconceptions floating around about Jesus, of course, and the gospel of grace. There always has been and there always will be until until Jesus comes. Misconceptions about his tolerance, his viewpoint of sin, his uh, dealings with his churches. Among these misconceptions are that Jesus would never issue a warning or some kind of stern rebuke or forceful reproof. There's misconceptions even among Christian people that our sin really has no consequences of any magnitude. It's all forgiven. It's all under the blood. It's all covered by grace. And so there's often little understanding that God may forgive sin, but he may allow you to live in a consequence the rest of your life. Related to that misconception, of course, is that Often the Jesus that people want to claim for themselves as their savior would never discipline one of his own beloved children. Or certainly not discipline an entire church body. This idea of correction or discipline or reproof really flies in the face of much modern evangelicalism. Many Churches, many preachers, many Christians have really embraced a a very soft Jesus, pillowy soft (laughs) words of softness and only kindness and what's been perceived as, you know, only loving. It's a T is a Jesus with no teeth, you know, a Jesus with no bite, a Jesus with no threat. A misconception that the Jesus that many want to worship would never have stern words, hard words of reproof. I believe this is really part of the postmodern culture that you and I live in. I've been thinking in the last week or two, the reality is our culture affects all of us and deeply and in ways that we are not always aware of. In fact, By definition, we have blind spots to the way that our culture affects us. It's easy to look in other cultures and see how it affects other people. And even to go back in history and say, how did they not see that? You know, how did they miss that about their culture? Well, Christians will be saying that about us in a hundred years. We're in a postmodern culture that has essentially redefined love and redefined forgiveness. Now, to be sure, he does love us. He loves us and he loosed us and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and father, Revelation 1. But this love and this loosing and this forgiveness doesn't mean that Jesus won't evaluate his church and discipline his own. Yes, yes, let us say again and again, he is full of compassion Full of grace and full of mercy. We're all sunk if he's not. (laughs) Woe is me if he's not. But he's also full of truth. That's what John said in John chapter 1. We beheld his glory. The one who was full of grace and truth. He is the one with eyes like fire. Feet like glowing bronze. A voice like roaring waters. And words like a sharp two-edged sword that cut and judge and discipline. In fact, it is because he loves us that our Lord Jesus is more concerned about our holiness than our comfort. He's more concerned about our conformity to his own image than our dreams. He's more concerned about our righteousness and our pursuit of righteousness than our feelings and our personal comforts. And so around 95 AD, the Lord Jesus weighed and measured seven local churches in Asia Minor. Seven representative churches along a postal route, all about 40 miles apart from each other. The result of that evaluation in 95 AD 
are the two chapters, Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. What's known as the seven letters to the seven churches. Seven letters from Christ himself. Making up really the first vision that John receives in the book of Revelation. It started in chapter 1 with this great vision of the glorified risen Christ. And, and Christ begins to speak to John in verse 17 Of chapter one, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And Christ does not stop speaking until the end of chapter three. Seven evaluations then of these real historical churches of the first century. And we've said two weeks ago as we began this study on these seven churches that there is really something here for everyone. And there's something here for every church in every age, in every culture, in every nation. We said also, and we had a handout a couple of weeks ago. I hope you have that. If you need one, they're by the door going out to the playground. But we said that these letters are form letters, essentially, or they follow a prescribed form. And the form itself has seven parts. And uh, as, as Jesus walks through his evaluation, two weeks ago, we started with the church In Ephesus, the first one there in chapter two of Revelation, verses one through seven, the church in Ephesus. And so a little quick review of the city and the church. Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a major metropolis, bustling city of commerce, education, politics um, and hmm, spirituality or pagan worship was rampant. Uh, Ephesus was a. A very licentious city, much like Corinth, full of sin, full of open rebellion against the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. There was fornication. There was sexual immorality, rampant drunkenness, uh, pagan worship, idolatry. Ephesus had the greatest temple, the greatest building of the day was the temple of Artemis or Diana in uh, Roman language. The temple of Diana, the goddess of fertility. And they worshipped her there at Ephesus and in this magnificent temple made of marble. It was the largest building in the known world. And it was a hub of activity, of of, of sexual immorality, of idolatry. It was a bank for merchants and kings. It was a place where criminals could go and find asylum from uh, conviction and prosecution. And so This was the nature of this city, a city of probably 250,000, which was quite large in those days, a port city there on the the Aegean Sea. The church was founded by probably uh, Priscilla and Aquila in the uh, 50s. The church was the mother church of this whole region. They probably had a hand in planting some of these other churches that will be addressed It was the largest church, the most influential church, the most outwardly blessed church of this region. And so the Lord starts with this church because of those reasons and because it's the first stop on the uh, postal route. If a person was going to go from Patmos, where John is writing in exile, they would come to the shore at Miletus and then they would go to Ephesus and then the journey would begin. The question we need to consider this morning is what is the spirit saying to us now, 21 centuries later? What is the spirit of God saying to you and me in this place today through these letters? That's the question before us. So let's read the text in Revelation 2 and see what the Lord has to say to us. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my namesake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. 
or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Well, this is part two this morning. We started two weeks ago on this letter and two weeks ago we saw the beginning verses of this and the beginning pieces of this form letter. And we worked our way up to and included the verdict or part of the verdict two weeks ago, the the part that was positive, the commendation and the encouragement of this verdict that is found there in verses two and three. And then he comes back to more commendation in verse six. And we looked at that two weeks ago. You can go watch that on our live stream or listen to it on the podcast if you need to. So today we really pick it up in midstream with continuing then in the verdict of this evaluation that the Lord Jesus gives this church amid this great commendation and amid this important and essential encouragement of really good things that they were about and good things that they were doing comes this one glaring problem. They had left their first love. Verse four, such penetrating words, are they not? Such incisive words of the all-knowing Christ with the eyes like a flame of fire. He can see past the deeds, past the perseverance, past their intolerance of false apostles and evil men. And he can see the heart behind it all. And he gives his evaluation in this one sentence. I have this. I, Christ, have this against you. Against you. That you, church at Ephesus, you, corporate body, plural, have literally let go. You have let go of your first love. In a nutshell, he is saying to these second generation Christians, this church is 40 years old. These are now second generation Christians. And he is saying to them, you have lost your fervent love for Christ, you've lost it. You see, the first love we have is love to God. We are to love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. That is the primary love. That is the great commandment. That is the first commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another is the new commandment Jesus gave in John 13. First love, love God. Second love, love each other. They have lost their fervent love for Christ, which means the domino effect is their love for each other will wane as well. You see, if the first is lost, the second is sure to follow. You can't have the second without the first. And so the second sometimes will be the way we know we don't have the first because that's where we live day to day. In other words, we could say the first love, love for Christ, is the source of all other loves. It really begins with his love for us. Chapter one, he loves us and he loosed us from our sins. It begins there. Then we respond in love to him. And then out of that love relationship with Christ comes a love for one another. And then a love for neighbor and a love for the lost. And so without a doubt, this is a stinging rebuke, is it not? Without a doubt, this is a serious, serious defect in this church and In any church and in any Christian heart. Commentator Grant Osborne pulls no punches. He says, quote, it is clear that the Ephesians loved truth more than they loved God or one another. This does not mean that they were not believers or that they had no love at all. Rather, their early love had grown cold. And had been replaced with a harsh zeal for orthodoxy. End quote. They'd left their first love. They'd let go of a passionate, fervent, zealous love for Christ. We know of an analogy of this, don't we? The analogy that we all know of is marriage. 
In fact, I've said many times, and the more I study the Bible, the more I see it to be true. There is no greater illustration and no greater analogy of the Christian life than marriage. Marriage is the is the clearest picture we can have of what it is to be a Christian. And so this is a very close analogy to what Jesus means here. It is like when a marriage has grown cold. Yes, you're still married. Yes, you still love each other, but it is lost fervency, right? It is lost attraction, is lost interest. It is just coexistence. We know what this is like if you've been married any number of years at all. Every marriage will go through this at some point. It's where you stop pursuing each other. It's where you start taking each other for granted, right? I know there should be some nods going on somewhere, at least on the inside. You stop dating, you stop pursuing as the man, you stop taking initiative, you stop responding, and it just kind of becomes roommate-like and and coexistence. And and we all know what this is like. It is where, yes, I'm still committed to this person, and yes, I'm still saying the right things often, and I'm doing the right things, but my heart is just not in it. My heart is not in it. That's what he's describing here in our relationship with him. He's describing the times in our life as Christians when we become distracted, distracted from the Lord, when our attention is diverted on other things, not necessarily going to the temple of Diana and hanging out with the criminals and the temple prostitutes. Maybe they're just good things, but they're not best things. Our attention is diverted from the main thing and the best things. And our priorities become convoluted, don't they? They become messed up where we're just not focused on the things we used to be focused on. And and this is all of what is involved in losing your first love. Now, let me say this. This is so critically important. And this will come back to us in the correction and in the solution. When we leave our first love in relationship with Christ, we will inevitably replace it with something else. You see, we are made to love. We are made to rejoice. We are made to worship. We are made to give glory. We are made to boast. We are made to have fervent love for something. And so as we drift away from first love for Christ, we will inevitably Replace that with something else that begins to own our affections and our delight. Now, to be sure, let's not overstate the case here. This is a a solid church. This is a mature church. This is a ministering church. These are real believers. To be sure, you can leave your first love and still believe in Christ. You can lose your first love and still actually have a love for Christ. It's just not like it was in the past. We all, if you've been a Christian any length of time at all, like marriage, you've experienced this and you know it to be a very subtle thing, right? A slow fade. A slow fade. At times indiscernible. It's the frog in the kettle and then one day you wake up and you go where am I who am I as I've thought about this now for two weeks in God's providence with Easter in between as I've meditated on this now it has occurred to me this conviction this rebuke happens to every Christian without exception I believe with all of my heart this happens to everyone because it can happen to anyone. And listen, if it can happen to anyone, then it's probably going to happen to you and me. Some have well said, if the Lord did not keep me in the faith, I would no longer believe. I believe that. If the Lord did not keep me, I would not persevere. And so we are just dealing with the reality of the fallen nature of our flesh and the struggle and the battle of the Christian life. Let's take it back to the church that we're dealing with here, the church at Ephesus. If this can happen to these good folks in the church at Ephesus, 
But rest assured, it can happen to you and me. This was probably the most privileged church of the first century. This church was the beneficiaries of ministries from Aquila and Priscilla, Apollos, Paul, Timothy, the Apostle John. This church was the direct recipient of eight New Testament books. What does that tell us? It tells us that no Christian is exempt, right? Not you, not me, no one. No one is exempt from this reproof of verse 4. So it begs a question, doesn't it? What happened? What happened? What happened to the Ephesus Bible Church? It had been 40 years since they formed. So let's just speculate a little bit. Let's ruminate on this. What happened? Well, they got older. (laughs) They got older. And as you get older, you lose some energy, don't you? You lose some zest. You lose some spunk. Their zeal and their energy has naturally diminished. What else has happened in the 40 years since this church is founded? Well, they've raised teenagers, all right? (laughs) Kids, they've raised kids, right? This is a whole generation. They're tired. (laughs) They're beat down. They're worn out just from life itself. What else might have happened? Well, it's probably likely that they had some zealous members of this church who have died. Some zealous members who were leading the charge among them, keeping them fired up, keeping them focused. Well, the Lord has called them home. And then here this suggestion, and I think this is probably closest to what is most accurate. They got used to being saved. They got used to the gospel. They lost their awe. They lost their wonder. They lost their worship. They lost their love. They just got used to it. They just like in marriage, you just get used to this other person and what they're going to contribute and what they're going to do. I think they just took Jesus for granted. They just lost their awe. There's some other ways we can consider what might have happened to this church. What might happen to this church, what might happen in our hearts. You know, we've talked about the city of Ephesus and the sin and that culture and the and the way this church was a lampstand in a very, very dark place. And so for 40 years, they have been standing their ground, right? Ephesians six planted in the gospel, armed To the teeth for spiritual warfare. They have been standing their ground. Against all of this sin. And maybe it's kind of hardened them. A little bit. Can you imagine raising kids in that culture? I don't know that you would let them out of the house. Well maybe this church had had few converts. Or no converts in recent years. You know churches need converts. We need to see new believers come into the family because new believers keep it real. (laughs) New believers keep it fresh. New believers remind us of when we were new believers, right? It's awesome when people are saved and they have that exuberance and that zeal and everything's new and and it's infectious and and it energizes and encourages the rest of the family, doesn't it? Well, maybe this church had not seen any converts for some months or some years. Something else may have happened. And I think this happens a lot in our culture. Maybe they kind of develop the us against them mentality. Maybe they were hunkering down in their little Christian compounds, their little enclave of Christianity. They're bunkers. You know, we're just going to hunker down until the Lord returns because things are so dark and so grim. And those unbelievers out there become the enemy and it's us against them and it's us trying to win the culture against them trying to win the culture and all of that kind of stuff sets in. And they had false teachers to deal with, all these folks running around that were false apostles. And, you know, after a while, maybe they just got battle hardened. You know, you're just standing against error all the time and you have that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. And just it just kind of you become crusty, right? Well, whatever the case, Ephesus 
Bible church had become formal. They had become a frigid church of cold orthodoxy. They had a frigid church of cold orthodoxy. So what's the lesson? Here's the lesson. Orthodoxy, right doctrine, and orthopraxy, right deeds, is not enough. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy is not enough. He wants our what? Love. He wants our hearts. He wants our affections. It's really not any different, I don't think, than the church at Corinth. It came in a different package. First Corinthians. And then first Corinthians 13. You're all familiar with it. What's it called? The love chapter, right? It's sandwiched in between 12 and 14, which is about spiritual gifts. So what's really going on in Corinth is you had Christians who love the Lord, but they were exercising their spiritual gifts without love, without love for one another, without love for Christ. They were seeking to get attention to themselves and and they were becoming prideful in their giftedness. And what did Paul say they would be if they exercise their spiritual gifts without love. He says they are a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> that's what we become when we leave our first love. So I ask you this morning, as I've been asking myself for the last two or three weeks, are you in this place? Am I in this place? Are we in this place? I suspect that the answer for many of us is yes. I suspect that, and I, and I reserve the right to change my mind as we go, but <laughs> I, I, ex, I suspect that if there's any church that lines up, if there's any of these seven letters or seven churches that we line up with the most, I suspect this is it. The word of God is for teaching and reproof and correction. And the living word of God who is speaking here is for teaching and reproof and correction. And so we move now from the reproof of what he has against us and leaving our first love for him in verse four to the solution in verse five. Here is the correction in verse five. Here is what you can do about it in verse five. You don't have to stay where you are. There is an answer. There is a pathway out. There is a way to become revived and renewed and reformed and awakened in the Lord. And it's in verse five. Let's just read it again and then unpack it. Therefore, because this is true. Number one, remember from where you have fallen. Number two, repent. And number three, do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. There are three commands here, rapid fire commands. They are connected and they are related. And together they give the solution. Together they give the correction. He comes back and emphasizes the middle command at the end of the verse. Did you see that? So it's remember. They all start with R. I'm going to package them in three R's. Remember, repent, and reboot. Remember, repent, and reboot. And he comes back to repent because that is the core of it all. That is the heart of it all. It summarizes all three. It starts then with remembering. Isn't that interesting? This is a command and it calls for continuous action. It starts with recall to your mind. Don't go do anything. Just sit down somewhere quiet and think back to where you once were. Remember what you once were, how you once acted, who you used to be. Maybe he's saying, remember what it was like when you were first Saved. Maybe that's what he's calling you back to. Maybe he's saying, church, remember what you were like when you were first formed, when you were planted, when you started the energy, the zeal, the excitement. Remember that you wanted to reach your community. You wanted to preach the word. You wanted to serve one another. Remember what that was like, church. 
Remember in your own life, maybe it wasn't your salvation. Maybe it was sometime after your salvation, especially if you came to Christ as a child and a young person. Maybe you will look back to high school days or college days or some other time and you'll say, oh, remember when I was so zealous for Christ back then. Tireless in ministry. That's what he wants you to do. This is where this starts. This is the beginning act to come out of this is to think back in your own life. And there's really a lot of encouragement here, isn't there? There is encouragement here because he's calling you back to something you once were. Not something foreign, not something unknown, not something just the the great Christians do, but even to your own life. And he just says, remember. Remembering is powerful. I mean, once a month we remember. Remember is essential to the Christian life. But here it's even more personal. Let me give you an example of how powerful memory is. The prodigal son. The prodigal son turned around and came home because he first did what? He remembered. He remembered what life was like in his father's house. He was there among the pig slop. And he said, my father's servants don't lack anything. And I'm his son. And so it says he came to his senses. And he returned. He repented and he returned. But it all started with him remembering something. Let's go back to the marriage illustration of leaving your first love. Well, often in marriage counseling. Often in marriage counseling. You're sitting before two people who have left their first love, humanly speaking. And one of the things you do as a counselor is you want to help them remember why they got married in the first place. Right? Sometimes it's, it's completely been forgotten. So much warfare, so much sin, so much garbage, you just completely forget. And so the counselor is there to be a, an instrument to say, I want to rem- help you remember Why did you fall in love with this person? What do you like about this person? What did you like about this person? What attracted you to this person? What traits did they have? What characteristics did you like? Remember. And that becomes the beginning of something being rekindled. Renourished. So he's saying here, remember your burning heart for Christ. Remember your big steps of faith. When you trusted God with childlike faith, remember your bold witness. Remember your church engagement. Remember your love for other people. How following Christ was the main thing in your life. It starts then with remembering. And this remembering actually never stops. The other two commands speak of something, a point in time, an urgent action. This first one is continuous. So it's while you're remembering, repent. And while you're remembering, reboot. The second command then, look at verse 5. Remember from where you have fallen. Where you have fallen. And repent. Repent means change your mind. It's a change of mind and heart that leads to a change of behavior and actions and lifestyle. Repent is to turn around. Repent is to go in a new direction. Repent is to stop this course of action and start a new course of action. It's it's to recognize where you are and to renounce this. And so what he's calling them here to do initially is to at least recognize your cold orthodoxy, your harsh orthodoxy. You have to see it first, right, before you can do anything about it. And then you need to reject it and renounce it. You need to come to terms with the fact that this is who you are and what you've become and call it what God calls it and and then renounce it and hate it. And part of repentance would be then to embrace a new attitude of love. Part of this correction then, part of this repentance will be to kick out the little gods that have taken the place of Christ. Now, I'm not saying you've bowing down at the at the. Rock of Diana, you know, worshiping the goddess of fertility. But we have these little subtle things that just work their way into our lives over time. And those have to be addressed. They have to be kicked out. They have to be dealt with. What he is saying then in repent is to change your priorities. Change your priorities. Renew your commitment. 
and turn around. Turn around. Remember, repent, and then finally reboot. Do the deeds you did at first. Remember from where you have fallen, how high you once were, how close you once were to the Lord. Remember that. Think back on that and then turn around and and go back toward that. And and then it's not enough to just remember and repent. Now you've got to put feet to your actions in your heart. You've got to do the deeds that you did at first. Do the first deeds. Do the first deeds. So I want you to ask yourself if this is hitting close to home for you this morning. I want you to ask yourself what were some of your first deeds? What were some of your first deeds as a new Christian or back to that time when you were more zealous for the Lord than perhaps you are now? I want to give you some suggestions. I want you to think about it first for yourself, though. But here are some things that came to my mind. As I thought back to my first deeds in the early days. What are those things I did then that I don't do now or as much of? Okay. The first that came on my list is this. I talk to God often from the heart. So I know every Christian struggles with their prayer life. I I compare my prayer life today to my prayer life at the first. And it was nothing then to pray for an hour or two hours at a time. And I've lost a lot of that, I will tell you. It's more of a chore. It's more work. It takes more effort. It takes more energy. It's uh, it's not as free-flowing. I talk to God often and from the heart. Here's another one. Devoured God's word. Right? Devoured God's word. Reading. Hearing. Studying. Memorizing. Meditating. God's word was foremost in my life, in my schedule, in my day-to-day activities. I'm just giving you suggestions of some of these first deeds. Perhaps at the first you memorized the word of God. You memorized passages. You memorized chapters. You memorized books of the Bible. Memorizing the word of God was something you did at the first, but maybe you've slipped away from that. So talk to God often. Devour God's word. Memorize God's word. Here's another one. Evangelism. What did I do then that I don't do as much now? Evangelism. Caring for one another like family members. Childlike acceptance of unbelievers. Evangelism. You loved weekly worship and preaching and serving and hospitality. You had more folks into your home back then than you do now. You gave joyfully, sacrificially, generously. Because you understood that you'd been bought with a price and all of your money belonged to God. Perhaps music played a big role in your life back then. Christian music of all kinds of varieties was essential in your worship, in your quiet times, in your mindset. And did I mention evangelism? Ask yourself, what did I do then that I don't do now? And the Bible says, do the deeds you did at first. Remember, repent and reboot then is really a call to shake off the lethargy and renew your love for Christ and then love for one another and then love for the lost. In other words, love is the answer. Love is the solution. Love Christ, love one another, love the lost. Well, what if we don't? What if we don't respond? What if we stay the frozen chosen? What does the text say? Don't take my word for it. Verse five or else. Or else I am coming to you. And I will remove your lampstand out of its place. The light goes out. The witness is removed. The church is dissolved, disbanded or dies off. Becomes an empty cathedral. A parking lot for a strip center. (laughs) A distant memory from the good old days. With love and witness gone, the church becomes a social club at best. At best. 
Or perhaps it becomes a museum for legalism. A museum for legalism where bored robots go through the motions of churchianity until the last robot powers down. And then they turn off the lights and close the doors. And that church no longer exists. I know it sounds like gloom and doom, and it certainly can be, but the other side of the equation is this. Can a whole church repent? Can a whole church turn around? Can a whole church remember and repent and reboot and do the deeds you did at first? Church history tells us this one did. This one did. Ignatius, a second century church father, wrote this. Paraphrasing, they heeded the warning, they repented, and they once again became a thriving church in Asia Minor. In fact, they were thriving so well that they last for centuries. Centuries, in fact, of renewed witness. And so we come to verse 7, and Jesus says, what he says in all of these letters, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Each church gets a personal letter, and yet all seven letters are for all seven churches. You notice that. He has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. It's like a coach who grabs one kid during a practice who'd been doing something wrong, wrong technique, wrong approach. The coach grabs that one kid, and he says to the rest of the team, the rest of y'all pay attention. I'm going to show you how to do this right. That's what these letters are doing. He's grabbing one at a time to particularly deal with their issues. But the rest of y'all pay attention because this is for all of you. This is for all of you. Has an ear. He who has an ear. This means the ability to hear. This speaks of a believer then. This is one of the elect, a true disciple of Christ. He who has an ear. Every believer has an ear. Because you've heard Christ, he's called you to himself. You have the ability to hear and respond to his words. That's what that means. Let him hear is very important because this tells us that it is not automatic. This is, in other words, hear and heed, hear and obey. Do something with this church. You can't just sit here and say, "Mm, that's probably right, that's probably true. I'm going to go on and have lunch now. You've got to act on this. You've got to do something with this. Or it's all for naught. It is not automatic. Just because you have an ear doesn't mean that you're going to hear. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean you're going to respond automatically. And so Jesus is emphasizing that it it involves action on our part. Action on our part. And then this promise to close the letter. To him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Each of the letters has a promise. In this case, it comes last. Of course, the tree of life is the tree of life from Genesis 2 and 3, made there in the, there in the Garden of Eden, the tree that they were barred from after they sinned, mercifully, mercifully barred from, banished from. And this tree of life shows up again in Revelation chapter 22. And here is this promise then to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, God's dwelling place where God lives. Access was lost at the fall, but it will be regained in paradise for those and by those who persevere, who overcome. This is a gift. This is a gift representing eternal life, eternal life that is shared by all believers. This is not a reward for obedience. This is not. Um, a payment for good works here. He is speaking of all believers who will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. In other words, enjoy the free gift of eternal life from God. But the condition here is they must overcome. You must overcome to meet the condition. That simply means it's not complicated. It simply means you must begin and continue in the faith. An overcomer is a believer. And a true believer perseveres. That's all this is describing. John used this word in 1 John. Listen to these verses. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 
And so overcoming is believing. It's a synonym. And it's a synonym for continuing to believe. If you are born of God, you will persevere because the faith that saved you is the faith that remains. And if your faith doesn't remain, then it didn't save you because it wasn't genuine faith. If it doesn't last, it doesn't save. And so he is able to make this promise, a promise for all believers, the promise of eternal life. In fact, I would say this promise in Revelation 2, 7 is no different than the promise in Acts 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's the same promise. The word believe there calls for continuous action, not a one time thing. And so if you believe and keep believing, you will experience full and final salvation. You will eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We don't have time, but you can jot down these verses that teach this doctrine of the perseverance of the believer. John 1, 12 and 13. John 1, 12 and 13. Colossians 1, 21 through 23. Hebrews 3, 5 and 6 and 12 and 14. Hebrews 3, 5 and 6 and 12 and 14. All of those verses teach this same doctrine that a believer perseveres and a believer must persevere. So here then is this promise, this glorious promise in its context of Revelation 2 and the book of Revelation in 95 A.D. Despite the devil's endless temptations and attacks, despite my sin against God and others, including the loss of my first love. Despite sin against me by both believers and unbelievers. Despite the death of loved ones, despite false teachers and the moral failures of truth teachers, despite church splits and church dysfunction, despite persecution, even to martyrdom, if you overcome through abiding faith, you will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The tree of life in the paradise of God. Can't find that in the temple of Diana. Let me close with this question for maybe someone here. What if you've never had a first love? What if you can't relate to any of this because you've never had zeal for Christ? You've never had a spiritual closeness to the Lord Jesus. You don't have that sense of, wow, I can look back and remember something. There's nothing you can remember. The solution is much the same. And I want to offer it to you this morning. What if you've never had a first love? Well, first of all, you need to remember. You need to remember that the Bible says that you are a sinner and you're separated from God. You need to remember that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. It was an event that happened 2,000 years ago that has been well attested by the word of God. Remember what God has done in human history. And then you need to repent. You need to turn around. You need to go a different direction. You need to stop going the way you're going and turn around and head in a new direction. And then I would say instead of reboot, I would say rest. You need to remember, you need to repent, and you need to rest. You need to rest in the finished work of Christ. You need to rest in the gospel of grace. God saves those who cannot save themselves. You need to rest that the Savior is sufficient for all of your sin. Some folks feel like they are so sinful that there's no way God can forgive them. Listen, the very Son of God shed His blood on a cross. He can forgive you. Your sin is not more powerful than the blood of Christ. Remember, repent, and rest. Stop trying to save yourself. You will never do it. Rest in Christ who alone can save. Let's pray. Father, we would ask for the believer here this morning that you would enable us by your spirit to remember, repent, and reboot. God, I just sense and feel that this is really close to home for many, many people here this morning. And I pray that we would not be beaten down by the word of God, but reproved and corrected by the word of God. 
We know, Lord, the responsibility is now ours. We have to act. We have to do something with these words, these commands, if we want to see a difference. We pray today, God, for those who are here who don't know Christ. Maybe they know about him. Maybe they've been in church a long time. Maybe their parents know Christ. Maybe they have a sibling that knows Christ. Maybe they have a spouse that knows Christ. Well, we pray for that person today. That they would be able to remember and repent and rest in the arms of a loving Savior. We pray in Christ's name.